Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we would look at CPA simulations that deals with gross estate. Now, gross estate is a topic that's usually not covered in details in college. And the reason is it's either the course is not covered or you take this topic last semester and you really don't care and you really don't pay attention. And what happened is when you get to the CPA exam, that topic is very challenging. So hopefully by going over these simulations, it's going to help you reinforce and learn this concepts. Also, I do have a, an explanation about the topic. So you could click the, click the description to see the explanation. So I went over, I explained what gross estate is. Now I'm going to be working simulations or exercises. These topics are typically covered in corporate accounting, obviously the CPA exam and the enrolled agent exam. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you haven't done so YouTube, please subscribe. I have 1,600 plus accounting, auditing, tax, and finance lectures. If you like my lectures, please like them, share them. It doesn't cost you anything. And if, if it benefits you, it means it might benefit other people. So share the wealth and connect with me on Instagram. On my website, you have resources such as uh, CPA exam questions, true, false, multiple choice practices, notes, if you're looking to practice for the exam, CPA exam, 2000 plus, 2000 plus CPA questions. So I strongly suggest you give it a look. So let's take a look at the estate formula formula that we looked at in the prior session. And this is the estate formula. Basically, we start with the fair market of gross estate, which I called line one. If you want to learn about this, go to the prior session. It's listed in the description. And so the exercises will be about this topic. Now in the next session, I would look at line two. And basically once you go through line one and line two, the rest is basically computation. So after the session, I would look at expenses, losses, and deduction when it comes to gross, when it comes to gross estate. So that's what I would do next. So to illustrate the concepts, the best way is to look at exercises or what actually they are. Exercises are actually CPA simulations. So let's take a look at the simulation. And you might be asking, how can you call an exercise a CPA simulation? That's exactly what a CPA simulation is. It's an exercise that you would see in college. Sometimes it's it's listed exactly as it is on the screen. Sometimes what they do is they will give you exhibits rather than giving you the information they, they they would give you exhibit and you have to take the information out of the exhibit so i will give you a few examples but i can't keep giving you the examples because it will go forever at the time of his death this year on september 4th Kenneth owned the following assets for example rather than telling you he died september 4th i can give you that certificate that will be an exhibit and when he died, he had City of Boston bonds, the fair market value, 2.5 million. Rather than giving you this information, I can show you I can show you Kenneth the brokerage account and the date of death, what was the fair market value. And I can give you a whole sheet that's very complicated, but basically it, do, it boils down to he owns City of Boston bonds and the value at 2.5 million. Same thing with the stocks in Brown Corporation, 900,000. Now I can give you those both of these information on the same brokerage account. For example, he held those accounts with Vanguard or with Fidelity. Okay, and that's all what they are. Now it's given to you here, or I can give you three page exhibit to show you this information. Promissory note issued by brand, Kenneth's son, 600,000. It seems he was lending his son 600,000. I can also give you an agreement, a legal document showing you that his son borrowed money from him for 600,000. So those are the three assets or the three, yes, the three assets that are part of his estate and with the fair market value. In October, the executor of Kenneth Estate received $120,000 of interest on the city of Boston bond. 10,000 was accrued since, since September the 4th. Remember, Kenneth died September the 4th. So we're gonna count all the interest up to September the 4th. Well, guess what? Of the 120, of the 120, 10,000 was accrued since September the 4th. What does that mean? It means 110, is not included so of the 120 of the 120 110 110,000 let me just see if i can do better with this 110,000 110 not include i'm um, sorry included 10,000 is not so this 10,000 i will not include it 7,000 cash on dividend on the brown stock dated 
the date of record september 5th well by september 5th he passed away again i cannot include those because he passed away by september the 4th if he he was living on september the 5th it would have been fine the declaration date on august 12th it doesn't really matter it's on record state he did not exist so on the record state this is when you say yeah if that person exists i'm gonna pay them did not exist therefore the dividend is out the six hundred thousand dollar loan was made to brad in late 2015 and he used the money to create a very successful business the note was forgiven by kenneth in his will so kenneth said i don't want the money uh, my son doesn't have to pay me back well well let's see what's going to happen now what are the estate tax consequences well so what's included in kenneth estate would, would we include the city of boston bonds of course we would that's 2.5 million included that's included. Would we include the stock in Brown Corporation? Yes. Would we include the promissory note issued by Brad that he forgave for his son? Sure. It's as if his son gave it to him, then he gave it back to his son. So it's his money. So that's also included. And we add to this the 110,000 in interest that he received. The 110,000. And this is my pen is acting up. 110,000. 110,000 of interest. So that's what's included. That's what's included in his in his estate. The dividend is not because we have to look at the records date. The records date, what we have to understand what, what is the records date. The records date is when the company, the issuing company, they look at the record and they see if that individual exists. Who's that individual? Well, really on September the 5th, Kenneth did not exist. Kenneth did not exist. Why? Because he passed away. Therefore, there is no, no dividend involved. No dividend involved. Let's take a look at the second question, at this question. At the time of her death on September the 4th, now very, very important to remember, those dates are important. Okay? Alicia had the following asset. Now we're talking about Alicia. She had a bonds of Emerald, Emerald Tool Corporation with a fair market value of 900000 Now, I can give you this information or I can give you her brokerage statement. Okay. Uh, stock in Drap Corporation, fair market value, 1,100,000. Insurance policy face amount, 400,000 on the life of her father, Mitch. And they're saying the fair market value is 80 and that's the cash surrender fair market value. Because if Mitch passed away, it's 400,000. If she wants to cash out, if she wants the value of that insurance, let's assume before she died, she can get 80,000 because that's the value of the insurance. How did we know the value is 80,000? It will be given to you. Now also, rather than give you this information, I can show you an insurance statement and part of that insurance statements will show what's called cash value and I will show you the cash value is 80,000. So I can, I can turn it into an exhibit. Traditional IRA, she has 300000 Okay, Alicia was also the life tenant of a trust. The fair market value of that trust is $2 million, created by her late husband. The executors of Bird's estate, which is her husband, has made a Q-tip election. Now, we need to talk a little bit about Q-tip real quick. I did not cover it in the... In the uh, in the recording. So what's the Q-tip? It's a qualified terminable interest property. And how does it work? We have husband and wife. Let's assume just kind of for the sake of illustration. Here we have uh, Bert and Alicia. Okay, husband, husband and wife. We have the husband is Bert. Alicia is the wife. Now, Bert passed away. And Bert what he wanted to do, he had some assets, but he wanted this asset um, to be first to be used by his wife, then eventually distribute to, to his kids. So, and usually this, the Q-tip usually, us, it doesn't have to, but usually what happens is, usually it's when you have a second wife and you want to protect your kids from your for, first wife, okay? Or the first spouse wants to, from the first spouse. So what happened is that's, Bert died, but he wants, let's just, it doesn't have to be, but that's usually when it happens. So what Bert wants to do, he, Bert wants to keep the money, to Alicia, but once Alicia dies, he wanted to make sure that the money goes to his kids. Whether they're from the first marriage or second marriage, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether the uh, the kids from the first or the second marriage. I'm just giving you an example um, to illustrate the point. So what we what what you would do is you would 
set up a trust called the Qt and you will have a Q-tip election. Basically, what's the Q-tip election? It means Alicia can enjoy the benefit of the trust. For example, if it's stocks or bonds, she can get the dividend, she can get the interest and live off that. So Bert wants to protect her while she's alive, make sure she has enough income. But once she passed away, Bert wants to make sure that the asset goes to his kids. So, so Alicia doesn't get married and run away, <laughs> right? That, that's, that's basically the idea. Okay. So that's the Q-tip election. And basically, so basically what happened is when Bert transferred the money to Alicia, then he did not have to pay any taxes on it now because he did not include that in his estate. So it was passed to Alicia simply in the form of a marital deduction. So we'll, we'll talk about the marital deduction next, but basically when you pass assets to your spouse, it, it's, it doesn't include in your gross estate. Now, Alicia also expired. Now it has to be included in her estate. So simply put, the two million will have to be included if the question is, is asking about this. So Bird did not have to include in his estate, but now Alicia will. Okay. In October, Alicia estate received an interest of 11,500, 6,000 accrued before September 4th, which obviously will be included, paid by the paid by Emerland and a cash dividend of 6,000 from Drab. Well, also, that's going to be included. The Drab was declared, on, let's see when, she, when the date of record. Date of record was September 3rd, so that's going to be included. So date of record of the dividend, she was alive on September 3rd, therefore, she's going to include that. Although Mitch survives Alicia, she's designated beneficiary of the policy, so Mitch survived her father you know, he's, he he's not, did not die yet. The IRA are distributed to Alicia's children. Doesn't matter what amount is included in Alicia's estate. That's the question that we need to answer. Well, what should be included? Well, the 900,000, of course, it will be included, okay? The stock in Drape Corporation, it will be included. Now, the insurance, only the cash surrender value because she would only collect the 400,000 if her father passed away. So she's only going to collect 80,000, the cash value. The traditional IRA, it will be in included. Bert estate of 2 million that was transferred to her in a Q-tip election, it will be included. The interest payment, only 6,000 will be included. And the dividend, she was alive, 9,000 will be included. So if we add them all up, they will they should add up to 4 million, 395,000, if my math is right. 4 million 395,000. Hopefully I did not did not miss anything. The 900,000, the 1 1.1, the 6,000, the 9,000, the 80,000, the 300,000 and the 2 million. That's the what's included in Alicia's gross estate. Let's take a look at another example. At the time of Matthew's death, he was involved in the following transactions. Matthew was a participant in his employer's contributory qualified pension plan. The plan balance was two million is paid to Olivia, which is his daughter and beneficiary. Very important. His daughter is different than his wife. The distribution consists of the following. Okay, so she, he got two million worth of value. The the employer contributed nine hundred thousand. Matthew's after tax contribution he contributed six hundred thousand after tax and income earned by the plan over the years, half a million. So overall, his pension was two million, and it's going to go to his daughter Olivia. Okay. Matthew was covered by his employer group life insurance plan for, for, for employees, the 200 proceeds paid to Olivia, the designated beneficiary. So Olivia gets the group, group term life insurance for her father. That's fine. What are the federal tax consequences of these events? Well, we need to know what are the federal consequences. Well, guess what? He's going to have to include in his estate $2.2 million. Why? It's the two million from the employer, the plan, the pension, all of it, plus two hundred thousand of the gross proceeds. That's included in his estate. That's the federal estate consequences. It's going to be included. And obviously, that's way below the no tax consequences from the federal estate perspective because that's below the amount that's required, eleven point four million in twenty nineteen, which is way below, not even twenty percent of that, or close to twenty percent. B the income tax consequences. What are the income tax consequences? Remember, Matthew will have to file his final return, and what's gonna include what's gonna be included in his final return? Guess what? Let's go back here. He's gonna include he's gonna include the nine hundred thousand what the employer contributed, okay? And he's gonna have to include the income earned by the plan. Those two are taxable. 
Why? Because he's going to have to file his final return and that's that's his income for the for for that for that year. Now remember the 600,000 is after tax contribution. It means he already paid money on that amount already paid money on that amount but the full thing will be included in his estate that's different so the full thing will be included in his estate but when he filed his final return that's what's taxable because the question is what's the taxable what would the answer to part a change if olivia was his surviving spouse not his daughter well if it was her, if, if if olivia was his surviving spouse that's fine it, basically there is no tax estate anyway but the point is that we're going to be kind of planting the seed for the next session everything will be included in his gross estate then everything will be deducted what am i what are, what am i talking about here here's what's going to happen so if olivia what his with his was his wife it's going to be two million remember the two million the two uh, let me just clear this okay so the, we would include the two million right here we would include the 2 million here then whatever the full amount 2.2 .2 million then it will be less it will be less 2.2 .2 million so the 2.2 .2 will be included in the first line then it will be deducted in the second line so it will be zero because that's his wife and anyway it's going to zero out because of the unified tax credit he's going to get enough credit that if we look at the unified tax credit here, that's going to wipe out because remember, his estate is 2.2 million and they'll give you a credit up to 11.4 million. So it's not a big deal. Okay. So that's the, that those are the consequences here. Let's take a look at this question. At the time of his death on July 9th, Aiden held rights in the following real estate. Okay. Apartment building, the fair market value, 2.1 million. Uh, tree farm, 1.5 million. Pastor land, 750, and res personal residency of 900,000. The apartment building was purchased by Cleo, which is his mother, and is owned in joint tenancy with her. So, so the mother paid for it, but he, he, he had a joint tenancy. The tree farm and the pastor land, those two, were gift from Cleo to, his, to, to Aiden and his two sisters. The tree farm is held in a joint tenancy, and the pastor land is tenants in common. Aiden purchased the residency and owns it with his wife. So the residency, him and his wife. And uh, as standing by entirety, how much is included in Aiden gross estate based on the following assumption? Again, this could be a typical um, CPA simulation on the exam. They would say, you know, if the amount and whether it's, you know, what's, what's the amount, if any, so on and so forth. Let's assume Aiden dies first and is survived by his mother, his sisters, and his wife. So he died first. If he dies first, here's what's going to happen. The apartment building, because it's a, it's a joint tenancy with, with, with his mother, it's going to go to his mother, basically because she's the sole owner. So for the apartment building, he's going he's gonna to include zero. He doesn't have anything because it's, it's owned by, technically owned by his mother and he dies before her. That's out. The tree farm. Well, the tree farm, let's see. The tree farm and the pasture land, we said... Let's go back here. The tree farm and the were gift to Chloe. The tree is a joint tenancy. Is a joint tenancy, and the pastor is owned joint. Uh, the tree farm is held in a joint tenancy, and the pastor is owned as a tenants in common. Tenants in common. Well, what's going to happen then? It's going to be because three of them. It's going to be one third, one third, one third for each one of them. So from the tree farm, we're going to include five hundred thousand. And from pastor land, easy numbers, 250, one third. Now, the residency, it's owned him and his wife, joined, uh, joined by entirety. Then it's we're going to include 450, which is 50. It's owned 50, 50 by each one. Under scenario A, we would include 1.2 million. Now, if we look at scenario B, Aiden dies after Chloe, after his mother, but before his sisters and his wife. Well, if he died... If his mother died first, then this 2.1 million, it was his now. So he's going to have to include this because now he owns the whole thing, 2.1 million. And what happened to the rest? Basically, the rest are the same. The rest are the same in a sense that 500,000, uh, 500,000 for uh, the tree farms, 
250 and 450 so the rest are the same let's assume on the C scenario Aiden dies after his mother and his sisters but before his wife well if that's the case his sister die, uh, dies and his mother die so he's going to include the 2.1 million he's going to include the full one the full 1.5 million we're going to add the full amount now the 1.5 because now it's his the 750 but his wife would still share half of the house which is 450 okay last scenario Aiden dies last which is his mother dies so the apartment building is his his sister dies now he owns both of these and his wife dies he got everything under scenario d all of those are included in his estate so it's very interesting uh, to see how this you know plays out see how this plays out now in the next session we're going to be computing the taxable estate and part of the taxable estate basically taxable estate is line one minus line two which is this is what i'm talking about here line one which is gross estate we talked about the gross estate less the expenses so we need to talk about line two this is what we're talking about here this is the second session and hopefully it will start to put this whole picture together the whole formula as always i would like to remind you to like the videos if you like them share them put them in playlist if you're studying for your cpa exam visit my website invest in your career it's worth it cpa is a lifetime investment good luck and study hard